So tonight is a little weird for my family. We are in the throes of moving. We are so in the throes of moving, in fact, that as of 5 p.m. tonight and until tomorrow morning, we live nowhere. But please don't worry about us. We absolutely have a place to sleep tonight that is not this chapel. But moving is a big deal. We're ending one chapter and beginning a new one. And it's often thought of as a chance to take stock of what one has, to sift through it and to cull it. As we've gone through our stuff, there ends up being two main categories of things we keep. Well, three actually. So the first is things we still want and need, which is fairly obvious. The second category is things that we want to put away as a keepsake to one day look back on and remember some moment that mattered, a drawing, a photo, a birthday card, a funny post-it note, or a memory of someone now gone. The third category is called, I don't care if we haven't used this in three years, I'm keeping it and this conversation is over. In our house, Jocelyn is the color and I am the keeper and we meet somewhere in the middle. These moments of culling and recalling are full of opportunities for reflecting back and projecting forward. I was sitting with Ravi, our four-year-old, and going through her very many art projects and we were deciding which of these we'll put into her keepsake box and what will go. And she asked me, when will we look at these again? And I said, when you're older, in some years from now, when we're remembering together. And her eyes filled with tears. She wanted to look at them now and tomorrow and all the time. And I realized that I am trying to build her a future of good memories. And she is well, she is four and that's completely irrelevant to her. But I think about which stories we tell her and what she remembers, how the choices that we make now will surely shape her future. Liminal moments of transition, like moving, are good for thoughts like these. Thoughts about past and present and all of its impact on the future. Deuteronomy, where we are now in Torah, is a book that takes place entirely in such a liminal moment of transition. Through the whole thing, we're standing on the banks of the Jordan River, between the wilderness that we're coming from and the land of Israel, which is ahead of us. And in that liminal space, Moses has some things he wants us to know about the past and the present and all of its impact on the future. And Parshat Ekev, this week's part of Moses' speech, is particularly focused on this. He will come back again and again to the actions of those who came before us, the children who will come after us, and we who stand as the fulcrum between them. Moses tells the people, Ata over hayom et hayarden, you are about to cross the Jordan into the land. And immediately he then tells them, it is not because of your virtues or the goodness of your heart that you are able to enter this land. You, Moses goes on to say, are a total mess of a people. And then he recounts our messiness. But what does this mean? What does it mean that it's not because of our virtues that God is bringing us to this land? Then why? For whom? Moses says, Lama'an hakim et hadavar asher nishba Adonai la'avo techa. In order to fulfill the promise that God made to your ancestors, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You merit coming to this border of the land of milk and honey. Not because of what you did, but because of what your ancestors before you did. It was their goodness their actions, their hard and significant choices, 
Rock be'avotecha, because of your ancestors who God was drawn to love, Moses explains, are you here now? Whatever we might believe about God and whether God acts in the world like this or not, Moses is trying to teach our people something important here. He wants them to understand that hundreds of years before, people made certain decisions that have shaped the course of their life. And then, with this truth revealed, Moses now pivots in his words. So he says, it was not your children who saw the miracles God did for you or who witnessed God's lessons. It was you. Moses is subtle in his teaching strategy, but he's taking us somewhere. Because now, still ruminating on the impact that their ancestors had on them, they're starting to think about their children, the next generations. <coughs> Thank you. So they're starting to think about their children and the next generations that they are going to be responsible for. Those whose lives will be impacted by their actions, whose course of life will be shaped by their choices. Every step they take in the new land is gonna matter. Every way they act as a people, every law they make and each one that they break, it will all shape the future that lies ahead of them. There are people who are not yet born who are banking on their good choices. This is the moment that they become future ancestors. And Moses doesn't want them to miss this point. So his subtlety falls away. Bilimadatem otam et benechem. Teach God's words to your children, Moses tells them. Moses is trying to teach our people how to be good ancestors to the generations that will come after them. What ours did for us, we must now do for the next. I have this acquaintance, his name is Ari Wallach, and he's an entrepreneur and a wise thinker. He's created a project called Long Path, which encourages nurturing in ourselves a worldview that casts our eyes far down the road, that helps us see our actions as having serious and measurable impact on the future's future and helping to determine by our actions, what kind of life our future generations will live. Will it be just? Will it be gentle? Will it be livable at all? Will it be lonely or connected? He brings together science and spirituality and psychology and economy and ecology to invite people into what he calls future conscious behavior inspiring us, hopefully, to become great ancestors. Just what Moses was trying to do for us on the bank of the Jordan River. Just what I was feebly trying to do for Ravi, sitting by her box of art and photos. Parshat Ekev wants us to understand that our decisions have long, long ripples. We as human beings are wired to be short-term thinkers we are hungry for instant gratification. And in these days, it is understandable to think of only the most urgent things that are right before us. Ekev asks us, what would it take for us to also see a long path? To see ourselves as one day's ancestors and empathize with generations that we'll never meet face to face. For us to gaze at a horizon and know that our decisions now, even if they are hard or feel like a sacrifice, are a way of loving our descendants. CBE is a community that practices long path thinking in a lot of ways, beginning work together to protect our planet, building enduring Jewish community, and so much more. One example coming up this very weekend, as we'll see a way to sign up for this in the announcements, 
will be a meeting with Senator Schumer to help us stop discriminatory voter suppression and to restore voter rights. Imagine the long ripple effects of that action, not just now, but on the future generations of this country. CBE is a community of ancestors. And also, it is really hard to stay in that headspace. So I want to invite us, with Elul on the horizon and the High Holy Days speeding towards us, to ask ourselves in this moment of transition, in our calendar, maybe in our pandemic, we hope, how will the ancestors, how will we be the ancestors that our future generations need? What will we do and not do? What memories and values will we pass on? As we stand on the bank of our own Jordan River, we pray. May our descendants merit good and great things because of what we do today. Shabbat Shalom.